Welcome back to Think Tech. This is History is Here to Help. Today we're going to talk about where does Ukraine fit in the history of Eastern Europe? How did it come to be? And what will it be after this awful war? I'm Jay Fidel, and my guest for this show today is Carl Ackerman, a teacher of history, a fellow well-developed in Eastern Europe and Eastern Europe history. Thanks for joining us, Carl. Um, thank you, Jay. And you know, um, the professor I worked under at UC Berkeley was a guy named Nicholas V. Rizanovsky. He wrote the standard textbook. Um, and you know, he begins his textbook by talking about the area above the Black Sea and about Kiev. I mean, that's Kiev before Kiev, uh, you know, um, in, in his textbook. Okay, fair enough. And so, and so I, I guess, you know, one way to begin, you know, because there are a lot of people talking about the Ukraine these days, but, you know, even fine professors um, who have not studied Russian history and Ukrainian history per se, um, miss the fact that really the area above the, the Black Sea, uh, where, where Kiev is located, um, was, you know, a area that lots of tribes from the east, um, you know, including people like, you know, the Huns and the Khazars and, you know, would travel and they would generally meet agricultural peoples and conquer them and then stay around for two or 300 years. And, you know, the original Rus um, were the people who, you know, established Kiev. They probably were there long before Kiev. And, you know, there's some people, who, I, I doubt this, uh, uh, this historical explanation that say the, you know, that the Scandinavians came down and uh, there's a famous document called the Primary Chronicle and people established themselves a key. But I think they're around for a lot longer. But, you know, the first Russian civilization was a key. So Vladimir Putin has it backwards. Uh, actually, it was Kiev before Russia, uh, you know, before Moscow and before the Mongols sort of came in, 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 uh, in um, uh, from about 1240 to 1480 and, you know, removed this, the city of Kiev and, you know, and Russians moved north to places like that had already been established, like Nov Novgorod and as the Russians say, Moskva, we say Moscow. I don't know what a dairy farmer has to do with Moskva, but um, but we call it Moscow. You know, um, from what you say, it sounds to me like Ukraine is at the center of something. <clears throat> it's between Russia and all that Russia has been and Western Europe. And Lord knows Western Europe has been involved in a lot of history. And Ukraine is kind of in the middle. It's a large country. It has managed over the years to stay defined as Ukraine, although Stalin wanted it to go away in the Holodomor, his intentional starvation of the people there, and the takeover of that land for Russia. But it has retained in some character in, in all these years. It has no topography uh, that would bar an invasion, uh, no great rivers, no great mountains. Uh, it only has its his history and its culture and its people. And so it, it, it becomes an interesting example of how history and the history of the people around it have shaped Ukraine into what it is today. And it is a notable, a notable society today. Uh, and, I, and I wonder, you know, how, how close was it to the monarchy? Uh, it was part of Russia for a long time. Um, but how close was it to the monarchy? What was his, its involvement in World War I and the revolution? Can you talk about that? Let me answer your question first. There were you know, Ukrainian revolutionaries. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, people who, you know, um, speak Ukrainian can understand Russian and Russians can understand Ukrainians. And um, so, I mean, there's a very close alliance. And there are often, you know, I one of my um, best friends um, in Russia was a guy by the name of Valentin Kozmich. He was half Russian, half Ukrainian, and just a wonderful man that I taught with at Special School 238 in um, Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. But let me let me get to the the the, the, the historical question at large. Jay, you know, you were really uh, quite accurate in saying that you know this is a giant plane, and you know around, you know, when I used to go to the Soviet Union around the. Uh, Kiev was actually very beautiful. It was like three quarters park. Uh, you know, the only thing that interrupted it was Chernobyl, which was a disaster in the Soviet Union. But what was what was interesting about the history of Ukrainian civilization is that 
it was well on its way to develop um, sort of a Western style, um, uh, uh, perhaps prototype, you know, with the medieval Europe. It was, it was very much an agricultural uh, place with many different princes. Uh, there was a problem about succession, which is one of the reasons it, it, it fell uh, to the Mongols. But um, the interesting thing about it is it would trade with uh, Byzantium, with Constantinople. And, um, you know, it, it would, they would take goods down to the Dnieper River and down into the Black Sea and go to Constantinople. And they would get, you know, finally manufactured goods for their, um, for their, their wheat and their flax and their hemp. Um, which was all grown um, in the area around Kiev. And in return, they would get, you know, glasswares, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, it's from Kiev that Vladimir, one, uh, Vladimir, one of the princes, um, you know, accepted Christianity and not Catholicism, the Eastern Orthodox uh, Christianity, you know, the uh, Greek form of Christianity. And they also, you know, from um, that same uh, Byzantine civilization, they adopted basically the Cyrillic script, you know, which is, you know, a, a Slavic language as opposed to, you know, the Latinized thing. So there was a difference, but, you know, from all intents and purposes, from everything I've read um, from historians, um, Kiev was on its way, or Kiev uh, was on its way to, um, you know, producing a, you know, Western feudal and then perhaps democratic uh institution like the rest of uh, Western Europe. So, you know, it was modeled, even though the language and the religion were slightly different, but it was modeled on sort of Western European uh, um, examples. And what you what you um, asked me, Jay, was a key question. That is, well, what happened? Well, um, in 1240 uh, and to 1480, the Mongols came in um, and um, the Rus had to move northward because um, Kiev was des des decimated. And they moved to places like, you know, Moscow and, as I said, uh, Novgorod. But Moscow became the great gathering place after that. Um, and um, in addition to Moscow, uh, over centuries, um, you know, basically from the um, from the 15th century onward, um, Moscow became the great the city to be in. In other words, and with the Kremlin, which is the wall around the city, and um, which exists today um, in brick form. Uh, and um, what's interesting about all of this is that the the Russians in that area learned from the Mongols and they became, you know, um, very interested in sort of top down rule, whereas the Kievan example was a much more democratic, uh, even though they were ruled by kings and princes, there was much more leeway and flow. Uh, but the Mongols distributed a really top down um, very um, uh, authoritarian uh, type of framework. And interestingly enough, when the Russians decided to call their uh, leader, um, uh, which I, I do not think, well, it may have been true also in Kiev, but when they called their, their leader, they called him Tsar. And Tsar is simply the word for Caesar. You know, so it shows the origins of, you know, Byzantine um, influence and Mongol influence in terms of structure. Um, and, you know, so the reason that I'm highlighting this so much and we're talking about this so much is that, you know, it's 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 really not Russia trying to absorb a, a province that's going to be become part of Russia. You know, Kiev was Russia and it was the center of activity and it was the center. And of course, in the modern day, it borders a lot of Western territory. And because you have that you don't have any natural uh, boundaries except for farther north with the Urals, and that's hardly a boundary. Uh, you're, you know, it's not like the Rocky Mountains. Um, you know, this is why Vladimir Putin is so paranoid. I mean, you know, because people can invade Russia. And of course, Napoleon's <coughs> armies did, and also, uh, you know, Hitler's armies did. And, um, you know, uh, most of the republics, I, I think this is true of Ukraine, I could be wrong here, you know, joined Russia after the you know, the Bolshevik revolution in October, 1917. And, um, you know, and, and the Russians, you know, took over territory under the leader of the Red Army, Leon Trotsky. And, um, you know, uh, during World War I, um, Ukraine was a, a series of battles, but, you know, the Russians did so horribly in World War I that uh, they finally signed the treaty a little farther north in Ukraine is the, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, uh, which gave a lot of territory to various nations, especially Germany. So, I mean, although Germany will eventually lose the war, 
the Russians lost the war to the Germans, uh, you know, before before the Allies, you know, kind of, well, I don't know, you know, before, before the Allies really uh, became um, uh, victorious. A couple uh, of things come out of that. Why yeah. in the 15th century uh, was Ukraine and whatever society it had at the time more um, open to um, representative government, to democracy from a, a sort of a transparency point of view than Russia was? What, 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 what factors played in there? Was it uh, because uh, you had migration coming from the Balkans or the Baltics or Western Europe? Uh, what made it different in Ukraine than in Russia then? Well, uh, you know, in other words, I'm not a scholar that, uh, that, that could pinpoint it, but I mean, in other words, I can, I can make my historical guess of what I think uh, is correct. And that is because of the trade, you know, that, you know, um, as 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 the Russians will move north, their primary mode of operation is, you know, agriculture, and their agriculture is being given up to whoever rules them. Um, until you know, basically 1480, it was given up to the Mongols. But so they had a more um, sedentary um, lack of ideas. Remember, Peter the Great was the one that wanted to f was build uh, uh, Petersburg because there was no warm water port. Well, there was a warm water port in uh, in in Kiev in terms of the Dnieper River. And, you know, I, I think it was the, because of the trade. My, my theory is because of the trade and the exposures to different ideas and, the, um, and, um, and uh, you know, the trade with, um, um, you know, Constantinople and getting, you know, you know when, they, when they will be, build uh, Hagia Sophia and, you know, when they, when they, will, when they will see, you know, the, the wonderful, um, you know, uh, wonderful churches in, in Constantinople that, they, that, you know, it's more openness. And I, I, you know, this is kind of, you know, this is kind of an unsung truism, you know, um, you know, in, in, in even in American history, if you go to someplace like Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Philadelphia, you know, you have these kind of cities that are on water and that, you know, are exposed to a lot of ideas. And if you go to the, you know, if you go to someplace like the, in the middle of Idaho, you, you know, you're, you're not exposed as much. I mean, now with the internet and things like this, this has of course changed, but you know, you, if you're farming most of the day and you're, and your and your and your horizons are um, focused on um, you know the farm and, and for good for good reasons and for, for luckily for all of us, um, but you know you're not going to have that kind of exposure. That kind of exposure, you know, can come from trade, but it could also come from boundaries that move back and forth while you watch. It could come from invading forces. It can come from influences, very negative influences from your neighbors and. Uh, people who, you know, countries who uh, would like to invade you and use aggression and and um, in, in so doing, you know, that may, you know, give you additional ideas and thoughts that you didn't have before at a price, uh, maybe a very serious price in terms of human lives. But I want to I want to take a snapshot with you um, after World War One. You know, we know that the um, that there was a fair amount of anti-Semitism. There were pogroms uh, in Russia, and I expect there were also pogrom, pogroms in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, what was the situation after World War I in terms of anti-Semitism? And after the Russian Revolution, you know, were, were people in Ukraine still fascinated with the monarchy? Most of the most famous pogroms will occur at the turn of the century, well before uh, World War I. But like in Kishinev, I believe. Uh, but 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 um, what's interesting about this is that um, that I think that you know both Russians and Ukrainians um, fell into this, as did much of Western Europe, um, as we're now seeing in France, for example. You know the conservative tendencies, but um, but um, and maybe right wing ten tendencies. But you know you know anti-Semitism is fueled by you know, being the other. And of course, Jews were not Christians. And so there were a whole bunch of laws that were extended um, for uh, Jews. And, and, and actually, where most Jew, Jews lived was in the eastern part of the country, including the Ukraine. I, uh, I'm sorry, the western part of the country, including the Ukraine. And, um, you know, set up by Catherine the Great, you know, a, a pale of settlement. Um, hence, you know, we always use, uh, Jay, you know, um, I think uh, Jews in America, the pale of settlement or beyond the pale. Um, you know, because you want to go outside of this settlement. Um, but um, so I, I think that, you know, um, 
Jews had a difficult time both in Ukraine and in in Russia, but not necessarily historically. Again, let me explain this one kind of breath of fresh air. Um, and it was it was before the Kievan state was established. There was a group of people above the Black Sea called the Khazars, and the Khazars really were quite generous. They accepted all religions, but several of the princes will adopt Judaism as their uh, religion towards the latter part of the Khazar um, Empire. And and you know that's a rather interesting that's a rather interesting uh, dynamic. So you know um, that was a bright light. But I, I think around World War One. Um, you know, shortly before, you know, World War II. And to get into a bit, you know, to precurse this whole subject, you know, about World War II is that, you know, the Ukrainians had to deal with Stalin and, you know, the Soviet uh, empire. And, you know, when the Nazis invaded, the question was, you know, are the Germans going to be better than the, um, than the, than, uh, than, um, than, you know, Stalin. And, and, you know, for most Ukrainians, they welcomed the Germans in. And um, it wasn't so much that they were anti-Semitic, though many were, um, but uh, they welcomed them in because they thought they would get a better, uh, you know, better rule than the um, than what um, Stalin had given them. But as it turns out, you know, the the ideology of the Nazis was that, that you know, Slavs weren't Jews, but pretty close. Right. So they, they weren't they weren't part of the Nordic race. So um, Jews did not fare well in Ukraine, I would say, from World War One up to um up to uh, through World War II and when they were part of the Soviet Union. Interestingly enough, I would make the case that um, that um, as as the Ukrainians turned to the West uh, and elected a Jewish leader, that the plight of Jews in Ukraine, except for you know some some fringe groups, um, and we have those fringe groups in the United States too, uh, becoming even larger um, because of uh, the political tendencies of our country right now. Uh, uh, you know, or you know. Uh, as let me, I, I would say, as Ukraine becomes more Western and uh, devolves from the Soviet sphere, the better for the Jewish population. Okay, so I was I was um, trying to get a snapshot of where things were after World War One, and I suppose as as uh, you know, Germany was unhappy uh, and it, and that made it vulnerable to the likes of Hitler. Um, Ukraine must have been somewhat unhappy too. Uh, you know, after the, the ravages of World War I. But now comes Stalin uh, in 1932. And I wonder if you could give us a précis on what happened in the Holodomor, why it happened, and what was the result? Stalin had this notion of, you know, that he had to, you know, and Ukraine was really, you know, the breadbasket, but also the area where most farmers lived. And so you have to deal with Stalin and a lot of the uh, Marxists, uh, the Bolsheviks, um, from their ideological point of view. And that, you know, the peasantry, which was identified with the Ukraine um, and, uh, you know, the breadbasket, so to speak, had to be ushered into collective farms. And the whole collectivization process that Stalin launched was to make the farms more um, factory-like because the, the end goal was the Marxian ideal with factory workers, because, you know, Marx didn't talk a lot about, uh, you know, the peasantry as sort of being a, with the exception of being sort of backward. And so, you know, the notion that, um, Stal that Stalin had was to, you know, quickly do away with as much of the independent farmers as they could, killing them as, nece as necessary, and mobilizing people into collective farms. And, um, <clears throat> And uh, of course, he killed millions of people that you were just referring to. He starved them. He intentionally yes. starved them. As my father once said to me, you know, when people start talking and are motivated only by ideology, it's time for him to leave. You know, <laughs> because, you know, ideology really shapes, um, really shapes uh, people in, a, in really foreign ways. I mean, they become, you know, geared more to the ideology than, uh, than to the... Um, than to, you know, practical ideal. I think you must be talking about the United States now. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, you know, there, there are certain aspects of, you know, contemporary right-wing uh, movement that sort of unites with this, with the far, with the far left in terms of, but, but it was, it was more, you know, Stalin's read and, you know, Lenin's read and Trotsky's read of, you know, that, that, that the peasantry were backward. We have to move these people to become workers because then when they're workers, we can have the worker state, you know, and it doesn't really, you know, you know, the the uh, history doesn't really fit it. Now, there was a Russian um, in the 19th century by the name of Alexander Ivanovich Herzen who 
um, believed that socialism could be built by the peasant commune, but the Obshino or Mir, but that didn't apply here. I mean, they were hardcore Marxists and they, they were, you know, believing their, you know, ideology. And that's, that's what, that's what caused Well, Stal you know, Stalin was also interested in consolidating power over Ukraine. Oh, of course. And, 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 and he and, did. And, you know, I mean, if you, if you kill the people there and you, you, as I recall, he moved Russians into Ukraine to do the collective farming. So he, he switched out the population, which is something like what Putin wants to do, I think. Um, yeah. And and as a result, Ukraine became a different kind of place. My question to you is, how did this affect the the preservation, if you will, of the Ukraine Ukrainian culture? Uh, how did it affect the uh, historical appreciation of of the West, of of how to become more West, more Western? Um, Stalin must have had a significant effect in the 30s on whatever Ukraine was as against what he wanted it to be. From all the different republics, they would have like a, you know, a showcase with, you know, Ukrainian flags and, you know, Ukrainian um, customs, and they would go to Moscow and things like this. But the real point of what, um, what Stalin was trying to do was to Russify. He wanted to um, make everybody under the empire Russian. And um, this is quite significant, Jay, because, you know, um, when you deal with someone like Stalin, you have to realize that although he was clearly a Marxist-Leninist, he also was, uh, as you mentioned, you know, an autocrat who loved power um, and was willing to do anything, you know, uh, that would justify, you know, his actions, including, you know, killing millions of Ukrainians uh, during the collectivization process. Um, but um, in addition, um, you know, he wants to, as uh, this is, and let me draw some parallels between Vladimir Putin and Joseph Stalin. You know, he wanted to protect Mother Russia. And, um, you know, after World War II, you know, the, the Soviet influence is great in all of Eastern Europe, except for Yugoslavia, which had its own army. Um, and so he couldn't control Tito to the extent that he wanted. But, uh, but you know, you know, Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, and the list goes on. You know, the Baltic countries became consumed by um, Russia, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and so uh, Czechoslovakia. And, um, and so um, he wanted to create a buffer zone so that if anyone invaded, they would, they would invade Eastern Europe first and then, and then get to Mother Russia. Um, the parallel here is with Vladimir Putin. And it, this is something really important that I think is left out of the dialogue. And that is Putin doesn't dislike the United States per se. I mean, the, the, Putin does dislike the United States, but not because of what people think. Um, he dislikes the United States because he sees the United States as part of the West. And the West, to Putin and to Stalin, represented decay, um, uh, uh, decay morally, spiritually, and, you know, a, a group of people who, you know, were wealthy, but, you know, don't really understand life. And, um, they, you know, they have, you know, it's like Dostoevsky, you know, in a lot of his novels, if you go, if you go to the West, you die. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so um, built in that, you know, when people like, I mean, not just, not just, you know, um, uh, Donald Trump, but before him, George Bush Jr., when they, when they think that they can see the soul of this guy, no, they can't. Or, I mean, if they did, they misread it um, because, you know, he's just anti-Western. So, when you make a deal with Putin, you have to do it from strength. And when you make a deal from Putin, you have to realize that he's not going to like you. I mean, you're, you're from the West. And, you know, Donald Trump, um, you know, I think uh, Joe Biden, under President Joe Biden understands this, but and because he's seen enough history to realize that the United States has to deal with strength. And, you know, uh, but Donald Trump really thinks that he can... Um, make a deal with everyone you know he applies his business you know skills what they are um to vladimir putin but putin putin's you know thinking um you know vladimir putin's playing chess and um and and donald trump doesn't realize he's playing chess and uh you know uh, donald trump thinks that putin is um is someone who can be bargained with uh because they both can get something good out of it and they'll both be friends for the rest of their lives that's not the way it works. And it doesn't work no, that way no. with China. 
and it doesn't work that way with 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 um, North Korea. You know, they're all looking for games they can make, and for all three of those dictators, they're looking for how they can achieve superiority over the West, and more specifically, the the group that represents the West to the nth degree, which is the United States. One thing, Carl, from what you say, um, they're unified in their dislike um, of the West and their criticism of the West and their competition with the West. But I suggest to you that it isn't because they really believe that. It's because it is a handy political argument that aggrandizes them, that gives them power in all of the cases you mentioned. Um, if, if I can find a, if I can scapegoat the West, I'm more powerful in my, in my home country. And I think, you know, yes, I agree that has been going on for a long time, post-World War II anyway. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily because Putin or any of the others actually believe the West is inferior. They just want to scapegoat the West in order to win the competition. Do you agree? Yes, you know, I, I do to a certain extent. I, you know, I, I do think that um, with Vladimir Putin, um, that he really, you know, um, you know, whenever you have an ideologue, and he's an ideologue when it comes to the West, he just is, you know, he tries to point things out. I, I'm sure he's well aware, um, because, you know, he has to deal with banking, that, you know, that there are many um, great things that the West can provide, you know, in, in terms of consumer goods, in terms of, um, how the West operates in terms of making good cars and, you know, all sorts of things. But he, he, you know, having realized that he doesn't want to um, sacrifice the Russian man or Russian woman um, uh, to get there. And, and, and I emphasize, and it's strange because Stalin was Georgian, but, you know, it was the Russian man and the Russian woman and the, and the you know, everything Russian that uh, both men, um, you know, really 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 admired and you know um it's 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 interesting because you know I, I think that um that you know th this is where that that kgb background for vladimir putin comes in because you know he uh you know he really think that he was humiliated when he had to burn and destroy documents i'm not sure it burned but destroy documents in um, east germany you know so i you know there's a there's something that's that's integral to to Putin that hates the West. Just a footnote to what you were saying about Putin's appreciation of the West. I recall, Carl, that at one point, it was decades ago, uh, Putin decided he wanted to have a business in Manhattan. What kind of business in Manhattan? Uh, a, a, a corner gas station. I, you know, that, that was such a mistake. You think about it, a corner gas station in Manhattan, that's ridiculous. But he was going to open up a Russian gas station, maybe Gazprom, uh, in Manhattan on a corner lot, and he was going to sell gas. And or he or his, you know, rich friends um, got involved in an American business in Manhattan. It failed. It failed. It's because I don't think that Putin really understood how you operate a business in Manhattan how you size up the market and supply and real estate and, you know, and all the factors in having a small business like a gas station. It is so interesting that this happened. We don't hear much about it these days. But I want to ask you the, you know, the ultimate question here is that Putin has, with, with due regard for his appreciation of history and ideology or lack thereof, he has certainly made a mess in Ukraine at every level. And he continues to make a mess in Ukraine. And my question to you is, how does this affect Ukraine? Because it has to have a profound effect on Ukraine. On the one hand, you know, they're smart, they're savvy, they're clever, they're building do-it-yourself weapons. Um, they're having trouble dealing with Western Europe, who doesn't seem to appreciate the need for support as much as they should have. Um, the sanctions haven't worked because the countries of Western Europe don't necessarily abide by them. Um, so Ukraine is under all this pressure and still it tries and Zelensky tries to retain, you know, the, the cultural excellence that, that he has found and that they have found. Um, Putin has had a, a, a significant effect on all of that. 
by destroying a good part of the country. So my question to you is, how has Putin's actions here, his aggression, um, for whatever reason, uh, affected the future of Ukraine? Can it be rebuilt or is it a matter of history? No, I, I think it can be rebuilt and I think it will be rebuilt. I think that, um, you know, that what, what Vladimir Putin has done is, you know, as I mentioned to you, my, my good friend was both Ukrainian and Russian, uh, Valentin Kotlinich. But, you know, what he's done is he's made it impossible for you know several generations for Ukrainians to accept Russians in any kind of cultural framework, um, and that it's driven you know a, a more nationalist theme into the Ukraine. And you know I think if you were to take a poll now, you'd probably get eighty to ninety percent of all Ukrainians wanted to join NATO. So he's driven a wedge into. Um, you know, create Ukrainian um, philosophy. And of course, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, probably who the Ukrainians most admire, probably Poland. Um, and, you know, the, that's interesting because, you know, you have a strong Catholic church and the Ukrainians are not Catholic, of course, they're, they're Orthodox. And so you're going to have a lot of, you know, of ties with the West. And, um, you know, depending on who wins the next election with the United States. So, I, I think that um, the end result of both Stalin and Vladimir Putin is to is to you know, create a situation where the Ukrainians do identify nationally, and they also are people who are, you know, um, going to go the Western route now, yeah, as opposed to going the uh, um, Russian route. And of course, you know, he you know he's responsible for two NATO countries, two new NATO countries in the far north, and. Um, <laughs> You know, so that's that's uh, that's that's craziness. But I mean, you know, in, in some ways, this kind of is a the good circle that you you've um, asked the question about, Jay. You mentioned you, as I always say. Um, you know, we've come full circle because you know this is the way um, Kiev was or Kiev was was um, developing anyway. I mean, you know, with with its own original civilization. It's only after things went farther north. Um, and, you know, and people were dealing with the Mongols who were actually quite lenient. Um, you know, they would, they would ask for conscripts for their armies, but they allowed basically, um, you know, religion to go on the way people wanted. And um, they took conscripts, but they, they took some taxes. But, you know, Mongol rule was not, not that terrible um, for about 200 years. The, more and more you hear talk about a, a settlement, you know, some kind of truce some kind of arrangement um, brokered by Western Europe and by the U.S. Sad to say, I, I always felt that Ukraine ought to go back to its original boundary rather than have to give up any land. And I totally agree with Zelensky on that. But, but the reality is that there may have to be a settlement just in the, in the practical view of things. And that settlement, um, you know, um, would, would probably um, change the border. Uh, right now, Russia controls 18, 19 percent of eastern Ukraine, the Donbass, and more. Um, and it controls arguably uh, on, a, on a kind of tentative basis the Crimea and those areas around Crimea. Um, but a settlement would probably take that away from Ukraine. And Ukraine would no longer have free access to the Black Sea. Ukraine would no longer have um, the agriculture that existed, that has existed in Donbass. Um, and th that's a, you know, that's, that's almost a fifth of the country and it's a big country. So that's a big fifth. My question to you is if that happens and it may happen simply because this is a war of attrition. We all know that this is a war where, you know, Western Europe, however, however vital NATO may be, however, mm, however, uh, uh, however problematic the EU may be right now, and the United States, however problematic it may be, at the end of the day, Ukraine may have to give up part of its territory to survive. Um, and, and the world will be suggesting that. So query, historically, what happens to Ukraine if it gives up 20% of its territory? Well, you know, I, I think Ukraine could still exist, of course. And um, but the question is, from my read, you know, 
that, you know, you can't really make a deal with Vladimir Putin on that basis. I mean, if the world comes in and forces his hands, you know, and says, we got to stop this killing, you know, and if Trump gets elected, perhaps that may be the case. Um, but, um, you know, nothing is stationary as long as Putin is ruler of, of Russia. So it's, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know with whether President Zelensky can really um, afford to compromise this way because he's built his whole political structure about no compromise until you know Russians off of our land. He may be forced to do this, but I don't know what his the political outcome for him will be then. Um, but uh, Ukraine can can exist, but the question is, you know, I, I just don't. I think that um, Vladimir Putin is too aggressive. And, you know, he's going to want more of Ukraine and he's going to, you know, the question is whether he then goes after other states. Now, uh, he's not going to go after other states if, if Joe Biden is in the White House. But if if Donald Trump is in the White House, it, you know, who knows? Um, because, you know, uh, I think Donald Trump is basically in many ways an isolationist. So um, I don't know whether what will I don't know what will happen. I mean, you know, the the, the you know, the. The real question is, you know, what's going on in France, what's going on in the United States in terms of this conflict. But um, there's so many ifs here that it's 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 hard to yeah. establish. I, I do think, though, to answer your question quite directly, Ukraine can, can, can survive. It'll just survive as a much less powerful country. And there may be shared resources in the Crimea, um, you know, which would be disastrous, too. Well, you know, the more um, isolationist we become, and the more isolation is Western Europe becomes, the less likely that we and Western Europe will continue the course or, you know, realize the promise of supporting Ukraine. So that's a, that's a great threat. And I think we're in the middle of that threat. We're at an inflection point, not only in the French snap election, which was a great failure, um, but in the election in November in this country, which could be also a great failure. So Ukraine, uh, as, as much as we would like to think it has the resilience to operate by itself, it has the strength, the moral character, if you will, the historical moral character, if you will, um, to retain its, its culture and its people, its economy, um, its, its government, its democracy, it, those things are not clear. We live in a world of uncertainty right now in, in all these places. So, <clears throat> um, Carl, uh, what would you leave with our, with our listeners? What, tell me, should they be optimistic or pessimistic about the future of Ukraine, all things considered? I, I think it's still to be optimistic. I, I, the way I would pose it is, you know, this is a 1,200-year um, search for democracy, you know, the, that began with the Kiev and Rus. And um, I still have hope, you know, that with, you know, with, with, with uh, President Zelensky. I mean, you know, and, you know, uh, I, I, I think that, you know, um, uh, that, you know, eventually um, the Ukrainians who are, you know, become very um, concerned about their national identity and their culture and their and their, you know, poetry and their music is, you know, I think this is eventually going to come about. And I think, you know, the other, the other circumstances, you know, what, what's post Putin look like in Russia? You know, I mean, I don't see anybody on the horizons and certainly not um, former president Medvedev, who's going to be able to do what Vladimir Putin has done. So we shall see. Um, and uh, one must, one must remember that after um, Joseph Stalin died, Nikita Khrushchev rose to power and there was a, there was a thaw. And so maybe during the thaw, um, um, after um, Putin passes on, there will be a, you know, um, a uh, flowering, as there was a flowering in Russian culture, there'll be a flowering of Ukrainian culture, but one can only hope. Well, I hope we can come to peace soon, not only there, but everywhere. So yes. we can address the, the existential threat that faces all of humanity, namely climate change, uh, and I, I like to remind everyone that that is happening relentlessly, inexorably, while we fiddle, uh, while Rome is burning, so to speak. Well, thank you so much, Carl Ackerman. Thank you for discussing these things, for helping us understand the history of Ukraine and how it plays forward. Aloha. Aloha, Jay. Mm -hmm.